Welcome to Women Who Sarcast. I'm Kathy Barron. My guest today is a workplace communications strategist and coach. She guides executives and teams to develop actionable strategies that foster emotionally healthy cultures and create boundaries and cultivate transparency in a high stakes environment. She has 20 years of research, publishing, and writing and understands the power of words. And she also wants you to stop believing everything you think. Please give a warm, sarcastic welcome to Nancy Berger. Whoop, whoop. Thank you, Kathy Barron. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for being on the show. I love being on this show, mostly because anything to do with sarcasm, right up my alley, <laughs> you know, words and all. Well, words definitely are related to sarcasm. <laughs> Boy, that and facial expressions. So there you go. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting reading your bio. It's like foster emotionally healthy cultures. I don't think I've ever been in an emotionally healthy culture <laughs> as far as the workplace goes. Really? Wow. Okay. Not really. I think it's always been, you know, that we're family environment kind of mentality. And on the outside, that looks okay. But in reality, I don't think that works very well. Well, you're right. And actually, that is a double-edged sword kind of situation. Like the, you know, we're like family here is loaded for the employee. It, it, it sets expectations in a kind of a strange way that sometimes crosses boundaries of the workplace. So that that is kind of quickly becoming obsolete and you know, organizations, psychologists and people in this in this space kind of don't really love that concept. Too much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to have a dis- dysfunctional family, but also have a dysfunctional family workplace. It's, yeah. you know, it's it like makes it harder to separate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But we can talk that about that another time. Because yes. that's a whole other episode. I'm it sure. is. But today we're going to talk about not believing everything you think. Yep. So what do you mean by don't believe everything you think? What I mean is that thoughts are choices. We tend to believe them when they emerge. Now, feelings are not choices. They are, they just happen to us. We cannot control them. But thoughts are choices. And, you know, it sounds kind of funny because you think, well, you know, I don't kind of sit and say, I'm, oh, right now I'm choosing to have this thought that I don't believe I'm going to do very well at this team meeting, right? No, we have a feeling that triggers a thought. But what I mean by don't believe everything you think is that until you understand sort of your tendencies for thought patterns, you can't reframe the thought. If you understand and are aware of where the thoughts come from, how you get triggered, what it's based on, then you can connect dots as to why you have certain thoughts. And then you can choose different thoughts, if that makes sense. It's not a conscious, like you, every thought you have, because we have tens of thousands of them every day you know, you choose, but it's based on your kind of imprinting, your wiring. So once you understand your wiring, then you'll understand why you tend to have certain thoughts and then you can shift and pivot out of those thoughts. So what are your thoughts on when people say thoughts are things? Is that the same as choices or is that different? It's a a little bit the same. Uh, Thoughts are things like they are not truth necessarily. They're really narrative that we create and we do that. It's absolute human nature to just create narratives all day, every day, make stories. We make stories all day, every day. And it's how we make sense of our world. We attach meaning to things. We want to understand why something is happening. So we, if we don't have anything concrete to depend on, we fill in the blanks with whatever. But often those narratives are not based on facts. Hmm. They And then we, when we create them, we choose to believe them. And where things get prickly is when we behave based on them. 
because then we can get ourselves into difficulty in relationships, difficulty in workplace dynamics, and it's all and it can all be based on fiction. And that's kind of unfortunate. So I don't believe everything you think is a powerful mantra that can kind of help you become more Mm self-aware and sort of cut things off at the past before you then go down the rabbit hole of behaving based on a false narrative. So you gave a good example um, referring to someone that has a dog and you think your dog loves you. Would you mind going through that? Yeah, like I just, this just came to me because I love my dog so much. It is the perfect illustration of creating a narrative. Like your dog, you you assume your dog loves you because it follows you around, you know, it does tricks, you know, whatever it is, it sleeps with you. <laughs> And your dog could very well think you're an asshole and you would not. How do you know differently? Because they give you a paw when you're holding a treat that smells like, you know, a rack of ribs. Well, I would do that. Or because they sleep with you. Like, okay. (laughs) Or when you like leave the house for two minutes and you come back (laughs) and they act like you've been gone for months. Gone for months. And it's a a kind of a silly example, but it does underscore how we convince ourselves of things, right? It's called cognitive bias. We all have them. We, we, We are victims of cognitive bias. One cognitive bias is called a confirmation bias. And what that means is you look... You, you convince yourself of something, you believe something to be true, whether it's based on fact or fiction. And then you look around for evidence that that thing mm. is true and you will find it. And then you fuel your own story, right? Mm-hmm. But it is a, it's a bias. And so the things I say are not like my opinion, you know, like the science backs it up. Research backs it up that we have a lot of cognitive biases and only one of them is confirmation bias, just looking, you know, I'm sure you've had this experience, like you, something happens, you explain it to yourself. And then you say, well, see, see, I was right. And see, see, I was right. (laughs) It's just what we do. Mm Because we just want to know. We We just want to be right. (laughs) We want to be right. And we want to know. We hate not knowing. We'd rather know something awful than not know. Yeah. So is that why we create these stories? So that we feel better about ourselves? Or just that we know. Like, we may not feel better about ourselves with the stories. Mm. That's how we get to imposter syndrome, you know, FOMO, all the limiting beliefs, the awful inner dialogue, the way we talk to ourselves sometimes, like no one, we would never talk to anybody else. Mm-hmm. That's also creating narrative. You know, well, let, let's think of an example, you know, you invite somebody to do something and they, they say, no, they can't do it. And sometimes if we're feeling insecure or like, you know, they, we're not sure the person's interested in having a friendship with us or a relationship with us. We explain it away by, well, see, I knew it was going to be like that. Like, why would they, you know, or they probably are doing something with somebody else right now. Or, I mean, Just pick your poison. I mean, there's a million stories we create. Yeah. And oftentimes, if we just have an honest conversation with someone, we can get the facts. But see, that's what I mean. If we create the narrative and then we believe ourselves and then we kind of behave based on it, maybe be a little cold to that person next time or not ask them again, then what are you doing? Then you're creating reality. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's not always a good, it doesn't serve us to do that. Yeah. Well, it seems like when we tell ourselves certain stories, like you just said about someone not wanting to hang out or something, it's like we almost want that to be true as far as our insecurities Mm -hmm. so that we can validate whatever we're feeling. Right. So then, like you just said, it's like, of course, here, here's proof right here. See? Yeah. Or I'm, you know, the I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough. That narrative gets fueled by those kinds of 
thoughts that we believe. And then you do it enough and you create some very strong pathways in your brain that fire the same way every time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people talk about this work-life balance or, or separating your work from your life. You, you show up at work the way you show up in, at home. It, it doesn't, you're not, you may have different affects. You may be a little more guarded at work. You may not share as much, but you show up, you're the person you are in both places. And when you have these kind of really strong neural pathways in your brain that are harsh inner dialogue or self-judgment or self-loathing, whatever it is, pick all the great feelings, um, you create a reality for yourself based because of that. And you can, you can just as easily, it's not simple, but you can create another reality by choosing different thoughts and fueling those thoughts and practicing those. And then you, then those neurons fire more sharply and strongly. And it's, it's just science, you know, it's just practice. So why is it so difficult for us to change the story? Is it because we want to be stuck in that self-pitying, insecure, because we feel comfortable there? Like we don't want to like change the channel because, you know. Yeah. I don't think we like it. We don't like to feel bad. But to your point, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. We're not great at, well, first of all, humans aren't really great at metacognition, at noticing their themselves, noticing their thoughts. We're just not really great at it um, because we're in our heads, right? So when we have a thought, we kind of go with it. We run with it. We don't tend to say, hmm, I'm doing that thing I do. Right. When, you, <laughs> when you can do that, it's hard to start. But when you can do that, it can be so freeing and enlightening. Like, wait a minute, I am really losing it right now. Like, let's, let me take a beat and understand what the chronology was, what happened that got me here. Like, you know, it takes energy. We're not really great at it. But if you can get more comfortable doing that, then you can start to understand and see patterns. You know, if you jot down, you know, journal a little bit. Not, I don't mean like journal, like write a page and a half of that. But just note like, well, this happened this day and I got really, really agitated. And notice what what how you're feeling in your body. Notice, you know, how you're talking to other people. If you get really cranky and edgy in certain situations, then you can piece together kind of what your triggers are. And then you can kind of do a deep dive into where they may be coming from. And I'll tell you, once you understand that a little bit better, it is, you can, it opens a lot of doors as far as how you feel in your skin and how you can show up in relationships and with other people. And it may sound a little bit unrealistic to some of your listeners, but I have undergone this uh, kind of, I won't say transformation, but I really worked hard at noticing myself. And some of the things I learned were like, I go off the handle in this situation. Like somebody might say, well, that's just the way I am. I get really upset when X, Y, Z happens. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the way you are for a reason. So Take a minute to try to understand it, and then you can do it differently. And then they have carte blanche to call everybody else on their shit because. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Have like an accountability partner. You get to call me out when I do this thing, and then I get to call you out when you do that <laughs> thing, and then we can just be pissed off at each other at the same time. <laughs> That's right. Then you can become some self-righteous boob because – you're more self-aware. <laughs> well, you know, in sometimes it may just be that people are like silently thinking, oh, she's doing that thing she does. <laughs> I mean, in my case, maybe. <laughs> hmm. Or my kids will say to me, you know, yeah, Ma. like I say, I noticed that I get really agitated when you do this. Yeah, yeah, we've all noticed that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, finally, she's realized yeah, what exactly. we've known for 20 years. <laughs> exactly. See? Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned that believing our own thoughts can kind of get away in the way of our progress. And you kind of mentioned note, noting like when you have like these self-realizations, how can we stop 
believing, even though Journey says, you know, don't stop believing. Uh, how can we stop believing everything we think so that we can move forward and onward? I mean, you mentioned a couple of things, but are there like certain steps or path to freedom? Yeah, I saw to get you a lot of new followers, Kathy. <laughs> Jeez, at this, that's sarcasm. I'm, I had to <laughs> check the box. Um, it starts at home. It, it, it really, it really does start at home. It starts at the beginning. Um, and lots of the work I do with people is digging into the beginning, early days, their their young warrior early days, or helping them find someone. A mental health professional that can help them, depending on the level of stuckness, depending on how, you know, because for instance, one faction would be if someone has experienced trauma in their life, and we all have to some degree or another, but I mean, seriously debilitating trauma, then that is stored in your body, your nervous system. And that person may very well drawn to people that trigger the trauma. It's called trauma bonds. They may form bonds mm -hmm. with people that are unhealthy mm -hmm. because of that. So I'm not a mental health professional and I'm not qualified to do that kind of work, but I will refer someone out. But let's just take the case of someone who, you know, gets in their own way, you know, thinks thoughts and, and behaves based on thoughts that don't serve them. Um, in securities or lack of confidence in, in communicating or whatever it may be. We go back to early days and it's not about blaming anybody at all. It's about understanding how you were imprinted. So we may map out, you know, when you were young, like what are some things that you remember happening to you that left an impression? More often than not, they're, they're negative experiences. They could be, mm -hmm. you know, deep embarrassment, humiliation, uh, someone in their first family um, expressing a lack of confidence in them or, you know, telling them they'd never be a whatever it was they wanted to be. And that mapping of those experiences then can help a person draw, con you know, connect dots. Oh, okay. I was told when I was a kid, or I had a terrible experience speaking in front of the class when I was a kid. I have trouble speaking with my team. It's not a leap, mm. you know, it doesn't take, but we don't often do that kind of like reflection. So I, I, the first step is really reflecting on where you came from because ignoring it or stuffing down those experiences can work intermittently, but it, you can't, you, you, you can't erase them. Right. You can heal them. Yeah. You can definitely heal them, but you can't erase them. And I think that we're under this strange notion that as we age, it just all evaporates. I was just going to say that. Yeah. As adults, doesn't. we think that it's, you know, because we've gone through so many other experience in between that that experience has been, you know, the, uh, the time frame. <laughs> what is it? Yeah. The, the, uh, it the, the, like it's dissolved somehow, right? But it's still within our body, and it's still within it's our in brain. your body. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and and it um, and this let's get out while I'm over it. Well, the, you may think you're over it, but it's stored in your body, as you said, it's stored in your nervous system, and that part is not logical, right? That's not your cortex. That's another. That's your nervous system. So you may find yourself facing a certain situation and then you have all these, this flood of feeling and then thoughts, and then you believe them and then you behave based on them. And it, it's coming from old wounds, right? So we mm -hmm. all live our wounds. That's just how it is. But boy, when you can kind of dig in and understand, you know, on the continuum, if they're, like I said, you know, you, you were kind of discouraged as a kid or somebody said something not really nice to you or a professor in college was really hard on you about something. And now you have trouble, you know, you get nervous when you have to write something or create a paper or whatever. So those are kind of the, the easier things to kind of connect dots on. Mm -hmm. But this, this, the significant trauma 
is really he is a, you are able to heal it with the right help, but if it's left unchecked, y- y- you will live your life based on those wounds. That's definitely come up for me recently, and it's almost like a wake up call. Like it's like you would think that I'd be able to connect the dots, but not until you really think about what's happening can right. you be like oh yeah that makes sense right and then I just go on about my business I don't do anything about it it's like okay well I've connected it that's good enough and but then the next time it comes up again so you know it's yes. that old you know brick on your you know falling from the sky and hitting you on the head to get your attention to do something right right yeah you know like the example of somebody not sort of tending to that kind of that part of themselves and they may have trouble in relationships. They may have trouble in at work in relationships or in reaching their potential or, you know, there's so many different, there's as many possibilities as there are people Mm -hmm. because we're all unique and we all have our own set of life experience, but it seems like you're expending a lot of energy stuffing it down. Why not expend the energy to figure out how you can feel better. Right. Because it's like, you know, getting a fish or learning to fish, right? Right. Once you learn to fish, you can apply these strategies or apply that healing and, and open up doors for yourself. It just seems like, but to your point, it's just hard to connect those dots. It's almost like when you have a backache, it could be your back. It could be referred pain from your hip, you know, like and sometimes it takes a someone who's really skilled at it to, to help you map that out. And that that's when mental health care professionals can be so critical. Right. Um, but in my work, I, it's extremely rewarding when I see a light bulb go, go off and somebody's like, oh, that's right. I forgot about that. And oh, oh, that had, probably has something to do with this. And, and then we start the work of reframing the thoughts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of this from experience, a lot of these triggers are hit when you're at work because, you know, depending on what you're doing, you're always dealing with multiple personalities of different people. Yeah. And that's when it's probably going to most come up, you know, especially if you weren't encouraged when you were growing up and then you have a boss that's the same way, you know, it kind of brings up that stuff. And having to deal with that in a work situation is, sure. it's tricky because in a way you can't, I don't know, I think it depends on the situation, but it's not easy to bring up to your boss, hey, you know, I have some trauma around this because of something that happened when I was five. I mean, that's just not realistic right. and ideal. Right. But here's the thing, Kathy, here's the thing. This is important. In your journey of kind of enlightening yourself, it not only it helps you show up differently for yourself and for other people, it also helps you navigate other personalities that may not be as enlightened Mm -hmm. as you are. You know what I mean? So in that work example you gave, like suppose your boss is perpetuating a little bit of toxicity or maybe there's some passive aggression or maybe they're extremely sarcastic or whatever it is, pick your thing. If you have not done your own work and you need and you're having, you know, you're stuck in fear based thoughts or negative inner dialogue or whatever the case may be, and you haven't done the work around that, it's going to be so triggering and it'll just become a churn, a perpetual, mm-hmm. self, you know. But if you have, it enables you to navigate that better. Oh, oh, I think he's, he may be, this may be a little passive aggression. How am I going to deal with it? Like, right. you know what I mean? So right. it's kind of like empowering on diff- on many levels Yeah, in those situations. But if you haven't done the work, then it will either open your eyes to having to do it or, you know, like you said, you'll just continually be in that cycle. Yeah. Of It'll be perpetuating what you're thinking, yeah. reacting, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 And for a lot of people, it, I think they're just like, forget it. It's just too much work. And I get it. 
and wow, you know, like that's, that's kind of a, a harsh, you know, decision for yourself because you want to, everyone wants to feel better, right? Nobody wants to feel badly. and Nobody wants to show up at work or in relationships or at home, just constantly feeling, I don't know, either invisible or wanting to be invisible or not heard or not know how to speak up for themselves or just unhappy or whatever the, like nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes, and this isn't the answer to all ills, but certainly to put a little work into understanding your own wiring and, you know, practicing strategies to change it so that you can feel more empowered and more kind of in control of how you show up. Yeah. Why not? You know, and we all have the power to do it. We just don't sometimes don't know how to start. Yeah. We need to like get rid of that defeatist attitude, I guess. I don't know if I would call it defeatist as much as just sometimes people just get this start sleepwalking. It's like they're Mm. sleepwalking. Like, Mm -hmm. well, I'm just, it is what it is. One of my least favorite expressions. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Um, You know, I'm got this far this way. So I might as well, you know, all these kind of like just mailing it in when, (laughs) when, wouldn't it be kind of great to, you know, try some things that by the way, you don't even have to, it doesn't cost you a thing. You just just try some things now. Okay. You start seeing a therapist every week. That's going to cost you something, but I think, I think we're in a time when businesses leadership managers companies are really having to pay attention to this this is you know i i don't want to i don't want to go down the rabbit hole here but this we are in a time when mental health is really uh we, we're in a bad space right now there's mm-hmm. just a lot of upset people are really trying to figure it all out and suffering. And so it's a good time to, you, you made the example, you know, you can't say to your boss, well, I had this drama when I was five and I'm trying to work through it. No, but you can, you can, it's more acceptable now than it has been for a long time. It's not destigmatized, but there's it's more normalized than it was Mm -hmm. to say, listen, I'm struggling and I need some support. And there's a, there are resources and support available. So you know, I hope people that are listening, if they are struggling, they seek seek those resources out because they're there. Yeah. I mean, even just on social media, there's always something out there, a resource for mental health. Um, yep. So, and everybody's on social media, so there is a way to, to reach out. Better or worse, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Double-edged sword. For sure. Everybody's yeah. private reality TV show. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, for being on the show. I always love talking to you, Kathy. You always teach me something, a little nugget. <laughs> so thank you. My pleasure. And you can find Nancy at nancyrberger.com and on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, and on LinkedIn. Yep. And yeah. So if you have any questions or are looking for some sort of um, training for your workplace, reach out to Nancy. She can definitely get you on the right path. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Women Who Sarcast. Thank you for listening to Women Who Sarcast, an independent podcast. Email us at womenwhosarcast at yahoo.com and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Women Who Sarcast. Get your copy of Women Who Podcast magazine today. Visit womenwhopodcastmag.com to subscribe. Show music provided by Mike Imbasiani.